Thank you very much to our host. Um, and welcome to everybody to our first, the first one in our series of webinars on recent developments in German competition law. Um, before I get to the agenda, I have a few uh, preliminary uh, slash housekeeping remarks. Well, first of all, don't worry about the bells. We are right next to a very beautiful cathedral um, that uh, gives us the time every 15 minutes. So at least you know you're almost through. And we know we're talking too much uh, when the bell rings. Um, but it's, it's very brief. Uh, second one, if you have questions, please type those in. Um, we will try to get to all of them, if at all possible, after we finished uh, our short presentation. If we don't get to them, don't worry, we, we're very happy to, to respond via email or even by call, if, if that's what you prefer. Um, third one, uh, if you need CLE credits, which some of you have indicated, uh, we will need to send you uh, a short questionnaire afterwards. Um, I think you will find uh, the question that's five of them um, should not be a major problem uh, if you looked, <laughs> looked at the slides or, or listened to the, to the presentation now. Now, without further ado to the agenda for today, we'll try to uh, cover recent events in mergers, cartels, uh, follow-on damage actions and abuse cases, and perhaps most interestingly for, for those among you who are not following uh, uh, every day's events in Germany on, on legislation, the plans for a revision of the Act Against uh, Restraints of Competition, which is our basic competition law. Um, we saw there are a number of participants in the conference who may, uh, may know an awful lot about this already and are real specialists. On the other hand, we also saw there are some that may have been lucky enough not to have had too much exposure to German law. So, so we're trying to strike a balance uh, when it comes to, to detail um, and, and, and somewhat more basic information uh, and, and apologize to both sides <laughs> if we're not hitting the right tone. But again, we, we're happy to respond to questions. But now let's start out with news on mergers and Stephanie will tell you all about that. Thank you, Alain. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to merger control, I'd like to focus on a question that uh, most of us um, are faced with uh, on a regular basis, I assume. Um, this is the question whether a transaction needs to be notified in Germany. Um, as you are probably aware, um, German law has a very broad interpretation of the notion of concentration, uh, which is, for example, much broader than the European rules. Um, so, for example, you will need to, to notify uh, the acquisition of a minority shareholding as of 25% or under certain circumstances even below that. Um, the bad news is, uh, in this respect, nothing will change um, with the revision of the law. But, on the other hand, uh, looking at the relevant turnover thresholds, there has uh, been an introduction of a second domestic turnover threshold, which is highlighted here on, on the slides, um, and which uh, I think made life uh, significantly easier because now you need at least two parties to the transaction who have significant activities in Germany. The effect um, of the introduction of the second domestic threshold, um, which was introduced in um, 2009, um, was um, quite remarkable. The number of notifiable transactions went down by 30 to 40 percent, according to the FCO. However, there is one question which is still not uh, resolved with sufficient clarity. And that is the question whether meeting both domestic turnover thresholds in and by itself indicates domestic effect, which is required under German law. Under the old um, thresholds, the FCO uh, was always looking for additional factors to, to show domestic effect. To uh, this end, it had published guidance where it said that, for example, foreign to foreign mergers only had a domestic effect if they um, affected the structural conditions of competition in Germany. So, for example, a joint venture with a Chinese partner, which would only be active in China, um, would not have to be notified in Germany due to lack of a domestic effect. So there is, uh, the, the, the guides paper is under revision and uh, there remains some doubt whether its criteria still apply today. 
Um, a case recently decided by the FCO did unfortunately not eliminate these doubts, um, but it suggests that the FCO in the future may continue to look for additional factors when establishing domestic effect. Um, when the FCO found that the US companies, um, EMC Corporation and Cisco Systems um, had or did fail to notify um, the implementation of a US joint venture, it did not only mention the fact that both domestic turnover thresholds were met, but also um, referred to criteria under the guidance paper uh, for domestic effect. For example, um, the FCO mentioned the fact that both companies had subsidiaries in Germany um, and that the relevant markets were worldwide. Um, something else I'd like to bring to your attention is the rather broad approach the FCO is taking when it interprets the notion of domestic turnover. Um, a transaction regarding the market for viscose fiber uh, was notified and pulled in autumn last year. And um, afterwards, the parties to the transaction and the FCO argued in front of the higher regional court in Düsseldorf whether the um, transaction concerned a de minimis market or not. In this context, the FCO argued that um, sales that were made to a um, production facility in Germany were to be qualified as German sales. Um, the, notwithstanding the fact that the production facility really only received the products, whereas the contract negotiations um, and everything else and, and, and the conclusion of the contracts was done by a central purchasing department, which was in Switzerland. Um, in its decision, the FCO referred to the Commission's um, consolidated jurisdictional notice, but I think um, the FCO stretched the concept somewhat because also in the uh, jurisdictional notice it says that the, the place which is relevant for the turnover is the place where the competition um, uh, about the, uh, for the customer takes place, which in this case seems to be Switzerland. Um, the court did not have to rule on the merits of the case because um, the motion was inadmissible, but um, it indicated that the FCO's arguments may have some merits, so it remains to be seen whether the FCO uh, will in the future continue its broad interpretation of domestic effect. Um, turning to the substantive assessment now very briefly, um, while there were recently only very few prohibition decisions, um, the cases decided show that the, uh, the FCO is not shy to prohibit cases, even uh, cases um, that had an, uh, a community dimension and were originally notified um, to the Commission in Brussels. In fact, two out of the four cases prohibited during the last 18 months um, resulted from downwards uh, referrals from the EU Commission to the um, FCO. The first one is um, the uh, Xella H&H &H, uh, international um, <coughs> transaction, which was interesting because um, the FCO um, chose a very narrow market definition which deviated from its previous case law. On these grounds, it rejected remedies offered by Xella, um, which were tailored to the um, uh, FCO's market definition in older cases. Um, this case, is uh, the decision is under appeal um, right now. Another case uh, worth mentioning is the um, RTL 07 Sat 1 decision. Um, it concerned the creation of a joint venture uh, for the app operation of an online video platform. Um, even though the joint venture would have been active on different advertising markets, um, namely the market um, for video in-stream advertising, the FCO found 
that the transaction would strengthen the um, duopoly um, on the German market for TV advertising, where the parties had a joint um, market share of uh, 80 to 90%. According to the FCO, the um, transaction would have also facilitated coordination of the two duopolists outside the joint venture. Um, one interesting procedural aspect of this decision is that the FCO reviewed uh, the transaction at the same time under merger control rules and under antitrust rules. That is to say, uh, section one of the ARC and um, article 101 uh, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, it also prohibited the transaction under both aspects. And uh, right now, the FCO is investigating a similar uh, cooperation between public broadcasting um, channels, but that under antitrust rules only. Um, to close with a positive point, <laughs> the FCO continues uh, to accept adequate remedies, even in very controversial cases. Uh, a good example is the Liberty Global um, Kabel BW case, um, which is another case referred from the Commission um, on the FCO's request, uh, and it concerns operators of cable TV in Germany. Um, there, the FCO cleared what was basically a three to two merger um, subject to uh, very far reaching remedies. Um, the, the decision received strong criticism from third parties and has been appealed by Deutsche Telekom. With this, I give over to Annette, who will tell us about recent developments in cartel enforcement. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, here we are. Uh, we'll start out with some statistics. Now, um, I, was, I was wondering whether I should really put that slide because it looks like fines are going down and um, it... Uh, I think that is a somewhat misleading picture. Um, for 2012, you'll see we're, we're sort of at a relatively low level, um, but the FCO is uh, at present investigating one of, of those cases that's been mushrooming and where um, fines are expected that may well bring us up uh, quite highly again on, on, on that scale. Um, so again, don't take that um, as a sign that the uh, Federal Cartel Office is no longer um, sanctioning cartels. Uh, because that would unfortunately be a bit risky. Um, the other thing you see on, on the slide, other than and, and then the fines, is the number of leniency requests and the number of cases. Uh, I think it's interesting to see how many leniency requests there really are. Um, as you can see from the numbers, there are many more leniency requests than cases, um, and that's simply because you may have several, or you usually have several leniency requests in a single case, so it's not just the first one, but, but also others that, uh, that may apply. Um, so let's turn over to just give a few more um, uh, highlights on, on developments. Um, the Federal Cartel Office now has three decision bodies that are dedicated to hardcore cartels. There had been only two for quite a while among the 12 decision bodies. Um, now there's a third one. Um, another element of interest might be uh, the announcement that there's going to be an increased prosecution of bid rigging uh, agreements. Um, that is important so far as bid ringing is presently um, the only type of cartel um, uh, where you have criminal sanctions in addition to the administrative ones. Um, and uh, it's important also for individuals because uh, they can be sanctioned again under administrative rules, <laughs> but also um, in bid ringing cases, the Federal Cartel Office regularly uh, forwards the file to the public prosecutor. Um, so the individuals can be sanctioned also um, under criminal rules. Um, then uh, a very interesting development, I think, is in a, in a very recent one, is the introduction of an anonymous whistleblowing system, um, which is based on um, recognizing, A, um, that's the easiest way uh, to find out about cartels if somebody tells you about it, um, and B, a lot of people don't dare come forward because they're afraid of appraisals. Uh, so, uh, reprisals, somebody <laughs> <laughs> mistyped that, I don't know why that is. Um, so, uh, basically a customer may not dare uh, say anything uh, against uh, 
the, the few people who are selling to them because they really need them, or an employee may be afraid that somebody else is going to, uh, uh, is somebody going to fire them if, if they go to the authorities. So this, uh, the federal cartel office wants to avoid that, um, and therefore has the system of um, uh, secure electronic mailboxes where it's not clear who is writing to them, but they still are able to communicate with them back and forth rather than just having uh, somebody on, on a hotline on the phone ones whom they can't call back. Um, the other thing of interest, although not really new, but uh, I think still, still very interesting, is the significant use of settlement procedures. Um, Federal Cartel Office uh, has been quite creative in those, because uh, unlike the Commission, there's not really any law about it, or at least nothing, nothing written. Nevertheless, the Federal Cartel Office has settled, uh, I think, about 25 cases by now, while the Commission has settled five. Um, and uh, is, is really very efficient about that. Uh, settlements are offered in almost all cartel cases, and what's interesting is that they regularly used in hybrid cases, that is to say in, in cases where not everybody is, is ready to settle. That's something where the Commission had been thinking about for quite a while because they, they said, well, we, we're losing all the uh, efficiency gains if not everybody does it. Um, now they are open to doing it, but, but again, they Cartel Office has done it right away and, and is doing it regularly. Um, the, uh, another interesting element is that uh, settlements may also help individuals um, in, in the process. Um, so that can be thrown into um, the settlement mass in some ways. Um, there is a significant speeding up of procedures. Uh, the EU is very proud that uh, settlement procedures take about a year. Um, uh, Federal Cartel Office has managed at times to uh, to do it in, in, in just a few months after the dawn raid. So um, it is really a very, very uh, efficient and speedy procedure. The, the system is quite different to the EU system in that, uh, for example, um, you have much more information from, from the beginning. So in the first meeting, the Federal Cartel Office will already uh, uh, not only tell you about the facts and how they how they see them, um, but they, they will also usually give you a framework of, of uh, or maximum uh, amount of, of a possible fine before you have to say more about what you think about the settlement. Um, there is also probably more scope to discuss um, what the scope is, so, so how, how many products are covered, what type of behavior, um, the duration. Um, I think that's that's more a practical question um, than anything else, but I think there is more discussion. Also, um, the Federal Cartel Office tends to cut off the fines before 2005, where you had a change in the rules about the fining. Um, then um, another, I think, quite important distinction is that uh, in a German settlement procedure, you need to concede the facts, but you don't need to concede the legal qualification of the facts. Um, unlike in the, in front of the commission again. Um, and then um, one of the beauties of the German system, I think, is that you have uh, truly short decisions in the end. Um, they're barely longer sometimes than, than, the, than the press release that the Federal Cartel Office would issue. Um, and, and again, I mean, the commission's uh, decisions are also very short, but um, they're not that short. <laughs> <laughs> so there's much more in there that can be used later by, by private uh, claimants. Um, moving on um, to some recent and ongoing cases. There have been, um, as mentioned before, a few cartel decisions already uh, in 2012. Um, they are, they're, they're, I think they're listed on, on the slides. Uh, interesting maybe that um, most of those, there have already been decisions or settlements before against other parties which shows that uh, in front of the Federal Cartel Office, you may very often have a situation where a case ends against one company in one year and, and against the next one in the next, rather than all getting the decision at the same time. Um, other developments, well, very important at this point. <laughs> the, oh, maybe not, not on, on these games, but still. Um, commitments uh, by the German Football League with respect to the marketing of media rights for the games of the first and second leagues, uh, very important. Procedure mm. must be fair, oh yes, <laughs> must be fair, non-discriminatory and transparent. Um, 
an ongoing investigation that I've also already mentioned that started out uh, in the market for rail tracks, but uh, that's been mushrooming and um, now there's all sorts of uh, parts of the of the rail system involved and it's uh, it's really expected to be one of the biggest cases that the Federal Cartel Office has ever investigated. Uh, and then we also have ongoing investigations of cartels in various food markets. Um, again, a mushrooming case uh, started out with coffee, then I think we had instant cappuccino, now we are going to sa sausages and chocolate and who knows where it will end. <laughs> so, next one, you, now we come to the first of our hot topics, of which there are two, um, and I'll quickly touch on the first one, information exchanges. Um, <coughs> quite uh, significant practical importance. The uh, Federal Cartel Office really regularly imposes fines for illicit information exchanges. It's certainly a topic that the Commission is also very interested in, and, and we know there are cases and there are guidelines and what have you, but um, the Federal Cartel Office has regularly sanctioned them. Um, some of the cases of the last years are mentioned in cosmetics, um, there's some drugstore products, um, some consumer goods, um, but uh, in, in all of these cases, I think none of our clients would have um, would have sort of been very surprised because the type of information that that was exchanged was clearly competitively sensitive. So I, I'm not sure they're giving. Uh, I mean, they're, they're confirming. I think uh, what we know. It's not a good thing if people get together and inform one another that they're going to increase prices soon or, their, or what their turnovers are or what their advertising expenditure is or that they will introduce a new product very soon, um, uh, what the conditions vis-a-vis -vis their customers are um, and, and all, of, all of this information. I think that is all information that you would usually in a competitive market keep away from your competitors. Um, What's interesting is that the, that the fines can often be as high as, as for price fixing, so it's really, it's not um, a sort of smaller um, uh, infringement, it, it's a very, uh, it, it is taken very seriously by the Federal Cartel Office. Um, and then may, maybe uh, one point about, uh, about guidance, um, uh, which can be found in a case uh, in the raw mill sector. Now, uh, you might think that is a, an awfully <laughs> regulated and unusual sector and has nothing to do with, with anybody else. But, um, but I think they're very important messages. And in fact, the, the Federal Cartel Office regularly confirms that, that it sees some of these messages as very important also for other industries. So um, one, one message is in markets where you have uh, significant fluctuations, um, an, an exchange of individual price data that's more than six months old, may already be considered as historic. Of course, it depends on the market structure and whether the prices are really fluctuating that much, but if, if they are, you don't have to wait for a year. Um, but looking at price, uh, you, you need to be sure that all the price elements really uh, uh, fluctuate that much. Um, so you could not show a price and certain elements of the price, namely some surcharges or discounts uh, that are six months old, if they do not fluctuate as much. So if the surcharges fluctuate only every two or three years, then um, you need to give the price as a total and you cannot split it up into the various uh, factors that, that uh, go into it. Um, moving 12 months averages may be legal if they permit drawing inferences on current data. So um, one trick could have been to uh, just uh, give a 12 months average uh, every month if the price changed every month, but that may not be a good idea because it still permits you to, to figure out what, what individual companies may be doing. Aggregations of at least five companies um, are usually okay um, if the largest one doesn't account for more than a third of uh, purchases and the two uh, largest ones collectively don't uh, purchase more than 60%. Um, if a company wants a benchmark against uh, uh, an average from, from its competitors, it shouldn't be able to pick the ones it's, it wants to look at. Um, it shouldn't just say, uh, I want to have an average of following five. Um, 
because that again might permit too much individualization. Uh, of course, all of these conclusions are subject to uh, further evaluation. There's going to be a field test by the FCO, and of course, they're also all market specific, so um, uh, this is not 100% transferable uh, to any other case. Nevertheless, hopefully, an interesting topic. One that is certainly interesting, I find. <laughs> it's a second uh, hot topic, and that is uh, on success and liability. And Thank that's you. Silvio. Thank you, Annette, yes. Um, indeed, um, the topic of success and liability for hardcore cartel infringements um, is a very important and uh, topic for, for the practice, um, also because uh, it can obviously have a major impact on the financials of um, corporate transactions involving companies which uh, were involved in, in a cartel. Um, in a nutshell, we can say that um, under German law, successor liability for cartel infringements is very limited um, and also much more limited than the concept that is used at the EU level. Um, it exists only according to well-established case law um, under two conditions, namely first, um, there must be a universal succession as opposed, for instance, to a mere transfer of assets. And secondly, there must be, um, as the court said, an identity or virtual identity of the assets and operations involved. Um, regarding this second criterion, um, the courts have developed three, if you want, sub-conditions, which are listed on the slide. The first one is that the assets and operations uh, must be kept separately from those of the legal successor. Secondly, they must be used in the same or at least a very similar way as before. And third, um, they must account for a substantial part, that's the legal term here, of the legal successor's overall activities. Uh, this restrictive approach has been developed over the last decades, one can say, um, and it was most recently confirmed by the Federal Court of Justice in two decisions in August 2011. Um, possibly the, um, the court restricted the scope of this concept even further, but um, in any event, uh, there are, I think, two very important takeaways. First, um, it was confirmed again that the substantial part condition uh, is at the focus of the legal analysis and that this condition is only rarely met. And uh, secondly, there seems to be quite significant uh, leeway, I called it on the slide, uh, for corporate structures um, in order to avoid successor liability. And um, I would like to illustrate this by focusing a little, more, a little bit more on the two cases that were recently before the Federal Court of Justice. The first of these cases is a classic um, takeover scenario in the, um, in the um, insurance sector um, con involving the companies uh, HDE and Gerling. Um, and I try to simplify the facts on this slide a little bit. Um, we have a, a company or a group of companies called A Group which has a subsidiary A, and this subsidiary was involved in a cartel. The FCO found out about that cartel and imposed a fine in the year 2003. A decided to appeal that decision. One year later, so while the appeal was still pending, um, A Group transferred all the shares in A to another group, the B Group, and uh, the subsidiary A was merged into a 100% subsidiary of the B Group. I called it here B1. Um, most of the assets of A were transferred to B1 in the course of the merger. However, um, some of the assets were also transferred to other groups, uh, to other entities within the B Group. And um, after that, the appeal originally launched by A was treated as an appeal by B1. Um, the regional court in Düsseldorf decided that uh, no fine can be imposed on B1, or in other words, that the appeal is fully successful against the original fine, um, and the Federal Court of Justice agreed to that. Um, two important messages in this respect. Uh, both courts shied away from defining um, a minimum threshold 
regarding the substantial part requirement. However, in this case, the assets transferred from A to B1 accounted to 56% of the total assets and operations of B1, and the court said that was not sufficient for the substantial part criteria. And secondly, both courts held that the transfer of assets and operations to other entities within the acquirer group, here B group, are not to be taken into account. The second case, I think, and many people think actually, goes even further. It took place in the ready-mix concrete sector, so in the construction sector. And here we had a company, X, a fully owned subsidiary of a holding company, which was involved in a cartel. The cartel came to an end in 99, but the FCO heard about it only much later. In 2003, Holdco decided to transfer all the assets of X onto another wholly owned subsidiary, Y, and then it merged X onto itself, so that X ceased to exist. Only in 2004, so after this internal transfer, the FCO started an investigation and then imposed a fine in 2007. Of course, because X did not exist anymore, the fine was imposed on Holdco. The regional court confirmed this decision on appeal. However, the Federal Court of Justice said that Holdco cannot be held liable for the cartel infringement by X. So this means that I think for the first time, at least in that clarity, the limited concept of successor liability was also applied to purely internal restructuring. And it's also important in this context, the main reason of the Federal Court of Justice was that the assets transferred to Y, the other subsidiary, could not be attributed to Holdco, irrespective of the 100% shareholding. Against this background, I think an important question arises, because one can now ask the legitimate question whether it may be possible to avoid successor liability by using the same kind of internal restructuring even after an FCO proceeding has started, or even after a fine has been imposed. Common sense would obviously, I think, say no, because that looks like an obvious circumvention of cartel liability. But against the recent case law, I think even this step further cannot be excluded. The FCO, and that's my last word on successor liability, is very unhappy about the current state of affairs. And the Federal Court of Justice, in fact, also made pretty negative statements about the existing framework in its judgments. However, in the current process of reforming the Act Against Restraints of Competitions, a competition, no change to the current concept is foreseen. With that, I think we leave the area of cartel enforcement and go essentially to the next step, and that is private damage action. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Silvio. As you know, members of a cartel these days not only face the risk of administrative fines, but they also often find themselves in court defending against private damage actions. I'd like to present two judgments which are of crucial importance for the environment under which follow-on actions can be brought in Germany. The first one is the so-called Orvi judgment of the Federal Court of Justice. The European Commission had fined producers of carbonless paper for a price-fixing cartel at the producer's level. The products were sold via wholesalers, and the claimant was an indirect purchaser of the cartelized products, which bought products from different sources, from independent wholesalers, but also from a company belonging to the defendant's group. The claimant now 
thought damages for the overcharge uh, regarding all its purchases of carbon uh, less paper, uh, irrespective of from which wholesaler they were bought or from which producer they originated. Um, and the claimant did not um, uh, sue A, but um, one step higher, so the mother company, which was also a producer and um, uh, subject to a final decision, the defendant. Um, the Federal Court of Justice made clear that, um, in principle, the claimant was uh, entitled in doing so. In the first place, um, the court clarified that indirect purchasers do have standing. That was a question that was highly disputed before and also um, decided differently at courts um, at, at the level below the Federal uh, uh, Court of Justice. The court argued that all um, market participants along the supply chain should be able to claim damages because, in principle, it is possible that they incurred damages if a cartelized product was sold with overcharges along the um, supply chain because it is possible that the direct purchaser passes on the uh, overcharges down the supply chain. Um, this is in line with the uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice. And um, um, at the same time, the, uh, the court made clear that the in indirect purchaser bears the burden of proof um, that it's of proving that it actually incurred damages so that indeed the overcharge was passed uh, along the supply chain to the indirect purchaser. A second important point, uh, which was clarified in this judgment, um, is, so to speak, mirroring the aspect of the standing of the uh, indirect purchasers. And that is the passing on uh, defense. Um, the court um, admitted this dis uh, defense, um, pointing out that it's a necessary corollary um, to the standing of indirect purchasers. So for future cases, that means if uh, a cartelist is sued by a direct purchaser, it can use the defense that the direct purchaser didn't incur any economic loss because it um, just passed on the overcharges caused by the cartel down the supply chain. At the same time, the court again uh, made clear who bears the burden of proof. And in this case, it's the defendant who is invoking this defense. And the court also explicitly said that the direct purchaser is uh, in no way obliged to provide information helping the defendant's case. Um, because the damages in question in, in the Orbi judgment um, resulted from a cartel that took place in the 1990s, the case was decided under old law that was applicable back then. In the meantime, um, a provision was introduced uh, in the ARC, which deals specifically with damages. Um, this provision contains a somewhat awkwardly worded sentence, which is um, often understood um, to exclude the passing on defense. However, this provision is highly disputed, and it remains to be seen how it will be interpreted in the future um, but one needs to hope that the very sound reasoning that the Federal Court of Justice applied in its Orbi judgment will also influence uh, the decisional practice in future cases. The next case I'd like to talk to, uh, I'm sure you all heard about, it's a famous Pleiderer uh, case. Um, background of the case is that the FCO fined producers of decor paper um, for a price cartel in Germany. The decision was made in a settlement process, and as Annette already pointed out, these decisions are rather court, short and uh, don't contain an awful lot of substantive information. So Fleiderer, one of the main purchasers of decor paper in Germany, uh, applied to the FCO for um, access to the file, including leniency um, applications and um, supporting documentary evidence in order to prepare 
a um, private action against um, the producers of the core paper. The FCO did not grant uh, Flydera access to the leniency documents, and Flydera uh, then appealed the FCO's decision in front um, of the uh, local court in, in Bonn, which is really at, at the lowest level of the hierarchical uh, system of courts in, in Germany. Um, this, this court in Bonn, Landesgericht Bonn, then referred the question whether uh, EU competition law um, prevents claimants from being granted access to leniency documents um, to the European Court of Justice for a pre preliminary ruling. So that was what triggered the, the landmark judgment of the uh, European Court of Justice in Flyder. The um, European Court of Justice made clear that EU competition law as such does not preclude um, claimants um, to gain access to leniency documents. At the same time, it also um, held that it is up to the national courts to decide based on their national law um, and on, on a case-by-case -case basis and uh, by weighing the interests protected by European Union law. And these interests are on the one hand the public enforcement uh, of the competition rules um, for which the uh, leniency programs are of um, utmost importance and on the other hand, the private enforcement of competition rules um, by means of um, private damage actions. In applying these principles set by the European Court of Justice, the um, Amtsgericht Bonn uh, denied Flyder access to uh, leniency um, applications and supporting documentary evidence. Um, the court held that um, leniency programs are indeed the most valuable and most powerful instrument to detect secret hardcore cartels. And that the effectiveness of leniency programs and um, therefore of future enforcement activities uh, would be put at risk if Flyderer were to be granted access to these kind of documents. At the same time, um, the court decided that um, documents which the FCO um, found in, in the course of its investigations uh, by other means could be made accessible to Flyder. So, for example, documents which were found um, during dawn raids um, could be made accessible even though this very same document may be an attachment to a leniency uh, application. As you can imagine, the Flyderer judgment caused quite some concern and <laughs> continues to be hotly debated. But I think at the core um, of this debate lies the question, is there really that much added value in, in, in leniency documents for uh, somebody who wants to, to do a follow-on action? Because claimants in, in damage cases um, usually have the, the main problem of, of proving and calculating their damage. But I think it's only in rare cases that they will find information on that point in leniency statements. Um, leniency statements deal with, with the infringement as such, and that is already proven by the finding decision. So the, the commission um, is right in pointing out that more um, a focus should more be on, on the proportionality um, in, when weighing these judgments and in identifying documents which are really helpful in preparing um, a, a private damage action um, and, and in really analyzing um, individual documents and not just granting access to, to, to the complete file. The Commission and National Competition Authorities strongly advocate the, the protection of leniency documents. And the um, Commission is considering to introduce legislation uh, to that effect. The same is true in Germany. And in fact, um, in, the, um, in an earlier version of the draft revision, there was a provision protecting leniency statement, but that was deleted during the legislative process after the Kleiderer judgment. Um, that came out. 
the FCO is lobbying to reintroduce that provision, um, which <laughs> would make a lot of sense because now it is really, uh, at least in Germany, in the hands of this one judge who, who is the Amtsgericht Bonn to decide in, in future cases or whether uh, access to leniency documents will be granted or not. Um, with that, again to Annette and some other uh, relevant developments in German competition law. Thank you, Stephanie. Others. Um, well, this is a hodgepodge of various <laughs> various elements. Uh, sector inquiries, abuse of dominance. Um, sector inquiries, first of all, that's really um, a means used quite frequently by, by the Federal Cartel Office. Uh, we've had many of them. Um, gas fuel, we just mentioned gas fuel, milk. Now we're in the food retail sector where, where the question is the relationship between the producers and, um, and the retailers. Um, who are really quite powerful purchasers, um, and uh, they are important, but they're also really, really a lot of work for for um, the poor victims uh, in the industry. Um, they're, they're truly massive data gathering exercises in the food retail sector, where um, they're looking, uh, where, where in the end they they want to judge on on about fifty thousand products. Um, they said we're being very modest and, and we're only asking questions about 250 products, but uh, still um, the number of questions about these products is, is phenomenal. Um, sector inquiries are often coordinated with other um, authorities and other member states or with the Euro European Commission. And what's important is, um, is that they very frequently lead to uh, abuse or cartel investigations afterwards. Uh, so there's a look out on the industry and then the drilling down into the individual infringement that we've already heard that right now there's uh, investigations in the food sector uh, against individual market participants. Um, another one of those is a very close scrutiny at present of the oil majors. Um, there's a, the Federal Cartel Office believes there's a dominant oligopoly between the five largest of them. Um, and again, that came out of the sector inquiry. Um, the cartel office is investigating into possible predatory pricing or margin squeeze cases against the independents. That is to say, um, the, the, the big ones um, price below cost in order to get, get rid of an independent, or they're selling to the independent at a price that is below um, what they're charging their own uh, final end customers. Um, apart from uh, leading to, to this particular case um, in favor of the independents, um, the sector inquiry has also led to a proposal to have more transparency in, in pricing of, of fuel um, and basically have the gas stations tell uh, a specific department of the Federal Cartel Office about uh, their prices. But there's a huge debate about that, it's in Parliament. Um, and uh, in fact, some of the independents have said that this is the death of, uh, mm. of uh, independent uh, fuel companies, gas stations, basically. Uh, very briefly on excessive pricing cases, um, simply because um, one has the impression that they're much more frequent in, in Germany than in the European Union. Um, they have very often concerned uh, formerly monopolistic oil presently monopolistic markets, de facto. Um, so in, in heating, electric heating, but also uh, water and, and similar. But there are also other cases, there are also other industries, and so I think it's important um, to recognize that excessive pricing is, is being taken seriously in Germany. Um, when are prices excessive? Uh, well, we have the old United Brands um, precedent from the EU, uh, if the price isn't correlated to the value of the product or service, no. um, how do I find out whether it is correlated or not? Uh, well, I can look at cost, but that's not the only measure because um, people do not sell at cost and also what is part of the cost measure, so it's not that easy. So I really need a benchmark to see whether something's excessive or not. And um, you can see in the Federal Cartel Office's cases that basically they're using all the possible benchmarks that have been described before, also um, in front of the Commission. Um, benchmark can be another product uh, that's being sold by the same company. 
um, it can also be the same product, but uh, sold at a time when there was no competition. Now that doesn't exist in some of these particular markets. And in, in cases where you cannot compare uh, either a different product um, of the same company or a different time frame, um, you have to turn to uh, a comparable company. And that is uh, what's been done in recent uh, cases, for example, the water cases. Uh, they looked at um, not only Berlin, which had really high prices, but they also looked at, um, uh, I think, Hamburg, Cologne, and Munich. Um, looked at whether their cost structure was, was comparable, um, and then also um, whether there was anything else uh, distinguishing the companies um, that would justify Berlin being so, so much more expensive, and basically found that there wasn't. Um, what's also interesting is that uh, in excessive pricing cases, you don't just have a, a sanction saying, well, you, you abused uh, your dominant position, and so you are fine. Uh, but you have uh, orders to reimburse the excessive part for the past, of the price of the past, um, and also um, forward-looking price reductions. So basically, the Federal Cartel Office telling uh, the company in question, uh, between 2013 and uh, 2016, your prices should not be above such and such range. Um, so I think that's, that, that is quite interesting um, because the Commission is still, has still not come up with guidelines <laughs> on this particular part of abuses, and uh, it's a frequent question we have. Um, very briefly, uh, one other case that's not yet decided, but that I personally find interesting, um, and that's um, looking into the lawfulness of most favored nation clauses. Um, these particular ones were in, contained in agreements uh, between a hotel reservation service um, and, and the people advertising on that service, the hotels. Um, and, and I think, uh, given how few cases there really are on, on these most varied nation clauses, um, there should be a very interesting one uh, to watch. And with that, I turn over to Silvia on the really exciting developments in uh, how our law is going to change. Thanks. Yes. Um, well, in Germany, we had a discussion for almost, oh no, for actually now for more than two years regarding um, revisions uh, to the ARC. And uh, the main objective is to bring the ARC even further in line uh, with the competition um, law rules um, at the EU level. And uh, finally, we managed to get the first round of parliamentary consultations behind us. And um, the currently existing draft bill may therefore be pretty close uh, to the final outcome. And um, I wanted to give a brief overview of the main changes, and I promise to be quick because we have used up most of our time. Um, the changes concern both merger control and uh, the antitrust area. Um, starting with merger control, where I think the changes are, um, perhaps we should say, even more profound. Um, um, on the notification criteria, first of all, of course, very high practical relevance. Um, the existing de minimis exception for um, markets with a market size of less than 15 million euro will be maintained according to the draft bill, um, but the assessment will be moved to the substantive analysis. And um, that is because the, uh, the FCO has seen that it is very often quite difficult to determine whether or not um, a, a, a specific market qualifies as a de minimis market or not. So now um, transactions will have to be notified even if they potentially or even clearly involve a de minimis market. Um, this leads to greater legal certainty indeed, but of course also increases um, the, the work on the notifying parties. Um, secondly, on notification criteria, um, mirroring the approach under the EU merger control regulation, um, there will be a new provision on staggered transactions, which are defined as transactions between the same two parties within a time frame of two years. Um, and those are treated as one transaction, the objective object, um, obviously being that the FCO wants to avoid that a major transaction it can be uh, split up into several smaller ones, thereby avoiding uh, the relevant turnover thresholds. Moving on to the uh, substantive test, 
um, as most of you, I guess, will know, um, Germany has decided to switch to the um, significant impediment of effective competition standard, uh, abbreviated as SIEC standard. Um, the currently used test concerning the creation or strengthening of a dominant position will survive as an example um, under the SIEC test, and one may say as by far the most important example. Um, this change was done after a long discussion in order to um, fill a perceived gap regarding certain transactions involving unilateral effects where the emerging parties uh, did not reach um, the relevant uh, dominance threshold, so which had to be cleared by the FCO even though the, um, the cartel office had perceived significant competitive concerns. Um, second point on the substantive test, um, there is a presumption of single firm dominance in the existing law, but it kicks in uh, at a market share of 33.3%. This um, threshold will be increased uh, to 40%. Um, this change obviously will also be important for the um, prohibition on the abuse of a dominant position. Um, and last comment on the substantive test, um, while it is not part of the new legislative package, it is worth mentioning that the FCO um, recently uh, published new guidelines on the concept of market dominance. Um, the new paper replaces a former version of 2000 and uh, it puts much more emphasis on a holistic approach and the need for um, a thorough economic analysis. In the end, this is what the FCO has done over the last years, so it is a useful reference to the existing case law, uh, not more and not less. Um, regarding the review procedure, um, it is again in alignment with the EU rules that um, there will be no longer a suspensory obligation regarding tender offers or share acquisitions on the stock market, provided that those transactions um, are notified swiftly to the FCO and provided further that the voting rights are not exercised until clearance. Uh, secondly, in the area of uh, remedies, the draft bill explicitly accepts uh, behavioral remedies. Um, other than many people had, uh, had hoped for, there will still be no possibility to submit a remedy proposals in phase one. Um, and if remedies, be it behavioral or structural, um, are uh, submitted in the second phase, this will automatically prolong the review period uh, of four months by yet another month. Um, final word on the review procedure. Uh, we, there is a special problem in, perhaps it's not so special to, to Germany, but it's uh, hotly disputed in, in Germany, and that regards um, how to deal with uh, transactions that were not notified, even though they had to be notified because they met the relevant thresholds. Um, here, the draft bill will not change the FCO's approach. The FCO um, reviews those transactions if they are notified post-closing um, under its divestiture rules, and uh, there will be there is no deadline that applies to this um, analysis. However, um, importantly, so far it was not clear what happened to the implementing measures that were already taken by the companies. And uh, the new law now says that um, these implementation measures are for some time invalid. However, once the FCO closes its investigation and finds no competitive concerns, then the implementation measures are cured retroactively. So that is um, a bit of good news, I think, because it provides for legal certainty. Bad news is, or not news, but bad fact, is that the companies still remain as subject to administrative fines for not uh, filing before closing. Um, important point, I think, while there are quite some cha changes, and I touched only on the most important ones, important elements of the merger control regime in Germany will remain unchanged. First of all, there will still be a need to notify acquisitions of minority shareholdings, either if they reach 25% or if they confer competitively significant influence. Um, secondly, 
we have not only um, the presumption of dominance in the case of single firm dominance, but also for collective or oligopolistic dominance. And those, I would add, unfortunately, will not be changed. Um, finally, there is a strange instrument in Germany, namely a ministerial authorization, which can override um, prohibition decisions by the FCO. And uh, this instrument will also continue to exist. It, in the past, it wasn't used too often, but it was used in high profile cases and um, sometimes really led to quite some uh, heated discussions in the energy sector, for instance. Finally, on antitrust, um, there I can be um, much shorter, I think. Uh, first of all, we had or still have uh, some temporary provisions um, in the ARC, which the FCO wanted to revisit down the stretch. They have looked at these clauses and um, have concluded that um, they will be prolonged for um, five more years. Um, those provisions concern first a prohibition on margin squeeze tactics um, intended to protect independent fuel stations. Secondly, um, the prohibition on even occasional uh, prices below costs in the food sector. Um, and thirdly, also a specific um, review regime um, regarding excessive prices in the electricity and natural gas areas. Um, also a word on remedies in the antitrust area. Um, after some discussion about an even bigger solution, the, um, the draft bill foresees that uh, the FCO may now also impose structural remedies to bring a competition law infringement to an end, again mirroring the approach that was introduced at the EU level, I think, eight years, nine years ago. Um, and also the, uh, the FCO will be entitled to request the repayment of um, illegally obtained profits from cartel participants, and the FCO may estimate uh, the amount of these profits. So if this becomes law indeed, then we should expect quite some protracted uh, fights and possibly also litigation on the determination of these profits. Uh, at the procedural front, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that the FCO will be given the right to ask for very detailed turnover data, which is important for the determination of any fine. However, an earlier version of the um, draft bill had also foreseen the right to ask for corporate links and shareholdings. And after heavy lobbying from industry, um, this provision was withdrawn from the latest draft. Uh, and now we essentially close the circle because um, three crucial issues, which we had touched upon earlier in this presentation, in the cartel and private uh, claims area, are, are not dealt with in the draft bill. That concerns first the expansion of the concept of successor liability. Secondly, the access to the FCO file, FCO's file in light of um, the bond judgment that Stephanie mentioned. And a third, there will, no, there will not be a, a new provision regarding the passing on defense or standing of indirect purchasers. Um, or, or say, there is a provision, of course, but uh, there will be no further clarification. So the Orvi judgment, um, this landmark ruling, will not be mirrored um, in the law. Uh, the, in terms of an outlook, and that's my final word, uh, the changes are expected to enter into force in January 2013. And right now, the discussion focuses on the extent to which the ARC should be applicable to health insurance companies. Uh, the, there is some to and fro in particular regarding the concept of an undertaking, whether health insurance companies qualify as undertakings. Right now, the draft bill foresees the general applicability of the ARC in that sector, which is important for the review of mergers, but also of potential information exchanges or coordination on tariffs and, and discounts, uh, but uh, I know that just as we speak, heavy lobbying is going on in Berlin, so I think the last word on this is not yet spoken. So I think these were really only 10 minutes. Um, we are at the end now. Many thanks for your 
attention, also in writing. And I don't know whether we have time for questions. Actually, I think uh, in spite mm. of the bells ringing regularly, we talk too much. So um, I see there are some questions, but um, we will answer those separately. Thank you again for your attention um, and hope to have you tune in again very soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Also in the uh, jurisdictional notice, it says that the, the place which is relevant for the turnover is the place where the competition um, uh, about the, uh, for the customer takes place, which in this case seems to be Switzerland. Um, the court did not have to rule on the merits of the case because um, the motion was inadmissible, but um, it indicated that the FCO's arguments may have some merits, so it remains to be seen whether the FCO uh, will in the future continue its broad interpretation of domestic effect. Um, turning to the substantive assessment now very briefly, um, while there were recently only very few prohibition decisions, um, the cases decided show that the, uh, the FCO is not shy to prohibit cases, even uh, cases um, that had an, uh, a community dimension and were originally notified um, to the Commission in Brussels. In fact, two out of the four cases prohibited during the last 18 months um, resulted from downwards uh, referrals from the EU Commission to the um, FCO. The first one is um, the uh, Xella H&H &H, uh, International um, <coughs> transaction, which was interesting because um, the FCO um, chose a very narrow market definition which deviated from its previous case law. On these grounds, it rejected remedies offered by Xella, um, which were tailored to the um, uh, FCO's market definition in older cases. Um, this case, is uh, the decision is under appeal um, right now. Another case uh, worth mentioning is the um, RTL 07SAT1 decision. Um, it concerned the creation of a joint venture uh, for the app operation of an online video platform. Um, even though the joint venture would have been active on different advertising markets, um, namely the market um, for video income, whether a transaction needs to be notified in Germany. Um, as you are probably aware, um, German law has a very broad interpretation of the notion of concentration, uh, which is, for example, much broader than the European rules. Um, so, for example, you will need to, to notify uh, the acquisition of a minority shareholding as of 25% or under certain circumstances even below that. Um, the bad news is, uh, in this respect, nothing will change um, with the revision of the law. But, on the other hand, uh, looking at the relevant turnover thresholds, there has uh, been an introduction of a second domestic turnover threshold, which is highlighted here on, on the slides, um, and which uh, I think made life uh, significantly easier, because now you need at least two parties to the transaction who have significant activities in Germany. The effect um, of the introduction of the second domestic threshold, um, which was introduced in um, 2009, um, was um, quite remarkable. The number of notifiable transactions went down by 30 to 40 percent, according to the FCO. However, there is one question which is still not uh, resolved with sufficient clarity, and that is the question whether meeting both domestic turnover thresholds in and by itself indicates domestic effect, which is required under German law. Under the old um, thresholds, the FCO uh, was always looking for additional factors to, to show domestic effect. To uh, this end, it had published guidance where it said that, for example, foreign to foreign mergers only had a domestic effect if they um, affected 
the structural conditions of competition in Germany. So, for example, a joint venture with a Chinese partner, which would only be active in China, um, would not have to be notified in Germany due to lack of a domestic effect. So there is, uh, the, the, the guides paper is under revision and uh, there remains some doubt whether it's criteria. Thank you very much to our host um, and welcome to everybody to our first, to the first one in our series of webinars on recent developments in German competition law. Um, before I get to the agenda, I have a few uh, preliminary uh, slash housekeeping remarks. Well, first of all, don't worry about the bells. We are right next to a very beautiful cathedral um, that uh, gives us the time every 15 minutes. So at least you know you're almost through. And we know we're talking too much uh, when the bell rings. Um, but it's, it's very brief. Uh, second one, if you have questions, please type those in. Um, we will try to get to all of them, if at all possible, after we finished uh, our short presentation. If we don't get to them, don't worry. We, we're very happy to, to respond via email or even by call if, if that's what you prefer. Um, third one, uh, if you need CLE credits, which some of you have indicated, uh, we will need to send you uh, a short questionnaire afterwards. Um, I think you will find uh, the question that's five of them um, should not be a major problem uh, if you've looked, <laughs> looked at the slides or, or listened to the, to the presentation now. Now, without further ado to the agenda for today, we'll try to uh, cover recent events in mergers, cartels, uh, follow-on damage actions and abuse cases, and perhaps most interestingly for, for those among you who are not following uh, uh, every day's events in Germany on, on legislation, the plans for a revision of the Act Against uh, Restraints of Competition, which is our basic competition law. Um, we saw there are a number of participants in the conference who may, uh, may know an awful lot about this already and are real specialists. On the other hand, we also saw there are some that may have been lucky enough not to have had too much exposure to German law. So, so we're trying to strike a balance uh, when it comes to, to detail um, and, and, and somewhat more basic information uh, and, and apologize to both sides <laughs> if we're not hitting the right tone. But again, we, we're happy to respond to questions. But now let's start out with news on mergers. And Stephanie will tell you all about that. Thank you, Annette. Um, with regard to merger control, I'd like to focus on a question that uh, most of us um, are faced with uh, on a regular basis, I assume. Um, this is the question still apply today. Um, a case recently decided by the FCO did unfortunately not eliminate these doubts. Uh, but it suggests that the FCO in the future may continue to look for additional factors when establishing domestic effect. Um, when the FCO found that the US companies, um, EMC Corporation and Cisco Systems, um, had or did fail to notify um, the implementation of a US joint venture, it did not only mention the fact that both domestic turnover thresholds were met, but also um, referred to criteria under the guidance paper uh, for domestic effect. For example, um, the FCO mentioned the fact that both companies had subsidiaries in Germany um, and that the relevant markets were worldwide. Um, something else I'd like to bring to your attention is the rather broad approach the FCO is taking when it interprets the notion of domestic turnover. Um, a transaction regarding the market for viscose fiber uh, was notified and pulled in autumn last year. And um, afterwards, the parties to the transaction and the FCO argued in front of the higher regional court in Düsseldorf whether the um, transaction concerned a de minimis market or not. In this context, the FCO argued that um, sales that were made to a um, production facility in Germany were to be qualified as German sales. Um, the, notwithstanding the fact that the production facility really only received the products, 
whereas the contract negotiations um, and everything else and, and, and the conclusion of the contracts was done by a central purchasing department, which was in Switzerland. Um, in its decision, the FCO referred to the Commission's um, consolidated jurisdictional notice, but I think um, the FCO stretched the concept somewhat because of screen advertising. The FCO found that the transaction would strengthen the um, duopoly um, on the German market for TV advertising, where the parties had a joint um, market share of uh, 80 to 90 percent. According to the FCO, the um, transaction would have also facilitated coordination of the two duopolis outside the joint venture. Um, one interesting procedural aspect of this decision is that the FCO reviewed uh, the transaction at the same time under merger control rules and under antitrust rules. That is to say, uh, section one of the ARC and um, article 101 uh, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, it also prohibited the transaction under both aspects. And uh, right now, the FCO is investigating a similar uh, cooperation between public broadcasting um, channels, but that under antitrust rules only. Um, to close with a positive point, <laughs> the FCO continues uh, to accept adequate remedies, even in very controversial cases. Uh, a good example is the Liberty Global um, Cable BW case, um, which is another case referred from the Commission um, on the FCO's request, uh, and it concerns operators of cable TV in Germany. Um, there, the FCO cleared what was basically a three to two merger um, subject to uh, very far-reaching remedies. Um, the, the decision received strong criticism from third parties and has been appealed by Deutsche Telekom. With this, I give over to Annette, who will tell us about recent developments in cartel enforcement. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, here we are. Uh, we'll start out with some statistics. Now, um, I, was, I was wondering whether I should really put that slide because it looks like fines are going down and um, it, uh, I think that is a somewhat misleading picture. Um, for 2012, you'll see we're, we're 